Welcome back to Reviews with Elaine, because I have opinions. And today's opinions will be about The Whispering Skull, Lockwood and Company by Jonathan Stroud. Okay, so I will admit I feel a weird sense of accomplishment for finishing this one, which is very, very silly. Okay, uh, so The Whispering Skull is the second in the Lockwood and Company uh, series. Uh, it is one of those series that honestly you can read the sequel having not read the first one, no problem, it's fine. Uh, but we are following another case with Lockwood, Lucy, and George. They are agents. Uh, see, in this world, around 50 years ago, ghosts started showing up everywhere. And these ghosts are not like just spooky shadow over there. These ghosts can kill people with a touch. They are very dangerous. And for whatever reason, kids are the only people who can see them, hear them, and therefore fight them. Uh, agents are kids with very strong psychic powers who are hired to go to haunted places, find and neutralize the source of the haunting. Uh, this is usually a physical object that has to be either burnt or wrapped up in iron or silver or lavender for whatever reason. Uh, but Lockwood and Company are the only agency in London that is run directly by the kids. Every other agency has adult handlers to guide the kids. Uh, and they are hired to do what at first seems like a very simple job. There's a company that is clearing out all the possible haunts in the cemeteries around London, because of course, obviously, in this world, cemeteries are going to be a very big danger. Uh, but this company is set up to handle minor haunts, like little shades and stuff. But they have found a grave that their psychics say is going to have something very serious inside. So they hire Lockwood and Company to deal with that particular ghost. And what should be a quick, easy, like, very one-night-only job devolves into a complicated mission which will bring them face-to-face -face with London's criminal underworld, powerful spirits, and the fragility of their own friendship and alliances. Uh, so this one just didn't pull me in the way I wanted it to. Which is a problem because for whatever reason, I am running really behind in my reading schedule. Like, I just have not gotten much reading done this month. And I prefer to have at least two weeks of re book reviews scheduled on YouTube in case something goes wrong or in case there's a book that I want to read that's really long and I don't have a lot of leeway with it. And right now, like, I don't have another book review coming out. It's this one. If I don't get it up by Saturday, I'm SOL. But the reason I bring this up is because yeah, when I picked this one up, I was specifically looking for something that was going to be a quick and easy read, preferably something I'd get done in a night or two. And I know that Stroud writes very readable, uh, and the kind of, he does the kind of plotting where one event happens after another, after another, after another, with very little downtime, so that it's usually really hard to put down once you pick it up. Also, frankly, this is YA, so I knew it was going to be easy to read. And in many ways, I wasn't wrong. The writing is intensely readable. Uh, Jonathan Stroud's writing style is interesting because it's really mostly very quick, simple, and readable, but there's just something about it that feels faintly Victorian. Uh, especially when you're reading Lockwood's voice. Like, it's not his POV, but we have a lot of, you know, him speaking. And he speaks in a polite, effusive, but somehow still really stiff way that just feels intrinsically like someone who's going to grow up to be Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but also, there's just enough slightly archaic vocabulary sprinkled in to make it feel like something older than it actually is. It also helps that the actual narration is usually describing things that feel Victorian. Uh, like, specifically, the book is, I'm pretty sure, set in the 90s. Uh, we have phones, but not cell phones. I think a computer is mentioned once. Uh, Lucy wears leggings, not corsets and dresses. There are electric lights, but what the narration chooses to focus on and describe are, you know, the fancy lanterns, the old architecture, the people who happen to be carrying canes, that guy over there who's wearing a, like, tailcoat. And all of this stuff is stuff that does exist in our modern world. But the author just chooses not to spend much time uh, describing the things that did not exist in the Victorian world. So there's overlap here, and we're just focusing on the stuff that existed back then. And there's a point in this book that Lockwood is wearing bright blue oversized shorts, and 
it's very jokey. And the joke is that it is so out of place on Lockwood, but also in this world that Stroud is describing. And all of this creates the vibe that we are reading something vaguely Victorian without bogging the text down with purple, heavy, archaic language. Uh, so I really like the writing in this one as much as anything I've read from this author. But this book did not quite have as tight of a pacing as his previous books I've read. And that's nowhere near a bad thing. Like, that is not a problem. Uh, I call books that do that, the really tight pacing, everything happening immediately after each other, and the reader just doesn't feel like they can set it down because we're constantly in the middle of rising action or climax. I call them crack books. Like, they are not necessarily good, but you get so into them you can't stop reading. And, like, they're fun. But they also tend to have plot holes that you don't notice when you're reading because you don't give yourself time to actually think about it. Uh, they often have little to no character growth, or they don't give enough time for the characters to sit in their emotions. Like, it's all just shit happening immediately after each other. It's the book equivalent of an action movie. And those books are really fun, but quite often they are sacrificing depth to the altar of fast pacing. So like the first one, the pacing is basically there's one big event at the very beginning that's an action scene that sets up the world. Then we have exposition and like finding details and getting to know the characters for about a hundred pages. And then there's almost 200 solid pages of constant action straight to the end of the climax. And that's fun. That's great. It makes you keep reading. It's very entertaining. But it doesn't always give you time to sit between the events. And this one has a much more traditional pacing to it in that, yeah, that we once again start with a big action event at the beginning uh, to set the stage. But then we have the more rhythmic, like, okay, a little bit of rising action, small climax, resting period. Rising action, small climax, resting period. And like each one's getting bigger until finally we're at the true climax. And the like big action sequence at the end is about 50 pages, not, you know, almost 200. And that's fine because it gives us time to really focus on the characters' relationships with each other, who they are as people, and stuff like that. But it also just gave me a lot more moments throughout the book to go, okay, I'm done reading for the night and set it down and not pick it back up. But I do also want to talk about the characters. So I absolutely love Lockwood. He is by far my favorite character in the book. He's interesting. Uh, I will talk a bit more about him later, I think. Uh, he's a little bit of an odd duck of a character. Uh, he is in many ways almost unbelievable as a character, but he's enjoyable. Uh, but the other two leads, George and Lucy, I need to talk about both of them. Uh, so Lucy in book one was a great character. She was a bit brusque, sometimes honestly a bit bitchy, but I liked it. I really liked the fact that we didn't need her to be an intensely sweet, enjoyable, friendly girl all the time. Uh, but getting to spend more time with her, she really starts to come across as a little bit mean. She's often fighting with George for seemingly no reason. She snaps at everyone. She thinks mean thoughts all the damn time. Uh, she seems to hate every other girl that she meets. And specifically, uh, there is this one girl that is a bit of her rival. Uh, like, she has the same psychic ability. She holds the same position in the other team that is their rival team. But Lucy is so mean about this random rival girl. She is constantly thinking about how pretty the girl is, but how, like, it's sort of bad that she's pretty. It's like, oh, she's dressed up so nice. I could never do that. And she's such a cold bitch. She shows no emotions. And, like, she's constantly going on and on about how much she despises this girl every single time they're in the same room. And then we finally get Lucy to meet another girl, and, yep, she thinks Flo is a bitch, too. Uh, and they start to almost form this weird little bitchy kind of friendship at one point, but I got so tired of hearing Lucy, or reading Lucy, thinking bitchy things about other girls. And, of course, the person that Lucy is bitchiest about is George. Uh, I sort of liked in book one the fact that they disliked each other pretty much on site for pretty much no reason. Uh, it was clear that they were setting up this general, like, they are going to learn to appreciate each other kind of friendship. 
And yeah, that is definitely what's going on here. We've developed a little bit from book one, but oh my god, Lucy cannot seem to go a single page without referencing how disgusting she finds George. She is constantly thinking about how fat he is, how smelly he is, how he scratches his ass, how his expression is dumb, how rude he is. And yeah, he is a little bit rude to her, but I would be too if this random bitch kept poking fun at me for how I look. And it doesn't come across as Lucy and George having a valid dislike of each other or even an invalid dislike of each other. It comes across as her bullying him and him just being cold to her because she's bullying him. Uh, even when, uh, spoiler alert, there is a moment when George is in mortal danger and Lucy still makes a passing jab about how he always looks that bad. And we see, like, other characters mentioning in passing that George looks a little bit disheveled, not put together, a little bit grody. But yeah, while we know he's not a looker, no one else is as mean as Lucy is. And because we're in Lucy's POV, we are constantly being inundated with all this hate towards an unattractive character. And it just makes her come across as a judgy, shallow bitch who's making fun of an overweight, awkward boy. And I will say, uh, this is something that overall I'm beginning to notice across all of Stroud's writing and really not liking. We get an awful lot of grotesque descriptions of characters we are supposed to dislike. Uh, like we meet someone and the first thing that is mentioned about them is how bulbous their head is, or how weedily their eyes are, or how saucers like their hands are. And I think part of that is because, especially in this world, we have all these grotesque ghosts and like he's clearly trying to set up this concept that like, oh, look, this grotesque language describing humanity is to show us that the humans are the real villains here, not the monstrous ghosts. Uh, ghosts are just mindless monsters, whereas humans are possibly actually evil. And that's great. But the constant, constant references to people being ugly is really beginning to make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, but that's enough talking about the things that I found annoying in this book, because there was a lot here that I really liked, and I would like to focus on that too. I know I mentioned in my review of book one, uh, but I still really like the way Stroud has set up this world to both give the child protagonists power and agency, but also to make them feel like they are being exploited by the adults around them. So the child psychics are literally the only one able to fight ghosts, like this is an element of this world, and so they are the only ones allowed to wander the streets at night. They are hired for these dangerous, complicated, yet respected jobs. They are given a hell of a lot more freedom of movement and the right to just, like, decide their own lives than kids get in our world, but at the same time, they're being treated as tools. Uh, it's pointed out a couple of times how many kids die with these jobs. Uh, there are several underage characters across both of the books who are left entirely to fend for themselves, with no adult support or safety net. Uh, and even though this is a fun kids book, uh, and therefore it wants its protagonists to have agency, and yeah, I get the joke, agents, agency, it's good, but it's it's also doing some interesting work drawing our attention to the horror that is kids who are making kid-like decisions being thrust into situations where they have to take care of themselves in life and death danger. Uh, and honestly, it's pretty subtle, like it's not like right up in your face all the time, but like there's a row of portraits of kids who died in action. Uh, it's in the casual dismissal of a boy almost dying. Uh, it's, you know, Flo, who is clearly a girl who has fallen between the cracks of society. It's Lucy, who almost fell through those exact same cracks. And it's the realization that the hardened criminal that we pursue in a good portion of the book is just a kid. And he had to just be a kid to be able to do the illegal job he was doing. And it's even in this weird addendum that this kid that was this hardened criminal has all these weird adult tattoos and no one thinks twice about all these teenagers like watching someone die in front of them 
and yet what's made a big deal about is the fact that they shouldn't be allowed to see these rather adult tattoos. And it's also in the fact that the kids come home from work at 4 a.m. and make themselves cups of hot cocoa before bed. And it's this absolutely beautiful balancing act of showing us the adult and the child within these characters. And it really drives home the questions of morality of, is it fair putting this much weight on these young shoulders? And I think that's all really well done. When I sat down to write this review, I really expected myself to talk a little bit about the fact that the characters' ages feel a bit washy. Like, Lockwood is probably the most obvious one. Like, half the time he's talking, you're hearing in your mind a, like, 30-something guy. And the other half the time, you're like, no, he's, like, 15. And uh, it's also true of Lucy, of George, of all these teenage characters. And I was originally going to say it's a mistake, because, like, it usually is. Uh, Jack Carver, Flo Bones, the Wickman's son, all of these characters are characters that when they were introduced in the book, I thought they were adults. It was like, in my mind, an adult person. And I thought they were adults up until the exact moment that it was made clear they could not be adults to be doing what they were doing. And Kipps, on the other hand, I have, since he was introduced in book one, thought of as an older teenager until it's made clear that he's an adult. And it's not 100% clear when the kids lose their psychic talents, and because of that, it's not 100% clear what age any of these characters are. Flo could be 15 or 19, Kips could be 19 or 24, and that bothered me a bit as I was reading it, but as I'm sitting with it afterwards, I realize it was supposed to bother me. Because a lot of what this series I feel like it's doing, whether it wants to or not, it is going to have to tackle the question of when do you become an adult? Is it a specific age? Lockwood owns a house and a business. Every agent we see lives away from their parents and works for a wage. They are allowed out after curfew and they are some of the only people allowed out after curfew. They have the trappings of adults, but to have them, they have to be kids because they have to have these psychic abilities which will disappear when they become adults. And that brings up the question of like, is it the loss of that ability that makes you an adult? Or is it the right to not go out and fight ghosts that makes you an adult? Is adulthood something that you gain? Or is childhood something that you lose? And I don't think it's a stretch for me to be asking these questions. I think this is in this book. And I feel like it's one of the big questions Stroud is just asking us to think about when he wrote this book. And like, I have no idea at this point what his answers are going to be as of yet, because, you know, I'm only two books into the series. But there is one moment in this book that I think gives us a hint of where the series will go with this theme. Uh, I won't tell you the context here because that would be major spoilers uh, for some of the big plot points. But one character says to Lucy on page 409, You don't yet know what it's like the day your talent starts to fade. You'll still sense ghosts. You'll know they're present. But you won't see or hear them properly anymore. You'll get all the terror without being able to do anything about it. So, yeah. I think this book is doing some really interesting things. I think it's a really fun, enjoyable book. The longer I sit with it, the more impressed I am with its themes and how it tackles them. Uh, I didn't like everything about it, but it's fun. It's cool. It's interesting. It's got a really fascinating style of prose. And just reading that excerpt aloud, I finally realized one of the reasons that Stroud's writing feels vaguely archaic is because of the order of his word choice, which I never got until I read it aloud. Uh, but, like, there's also an interesting theme of knowledge, forbidden knowledge, the danger of history, the danger of forgetting history, and, uh, like, there's also really cool ghost descriptions. Like, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in this book. I just didn't find it as addictive as I was hoping for at this particular moment. But overall, yeah, I think the second Lockwood and Company, it stands up. It's pretty good.